Hey everyone and welcome to another AP Environmental Science Lecture. Today we're going to look at aquatic biomes and aquatic biomes are a little different than terrestrial biomes in regards to how they're categorized and how we look at uh, characterize these aquatic biomes is by their physical characteristics. So we're going to look at their salinity, the depth of the water, and even the water flow. Temperature of the water is an important factor in determining where and which species can survive in a particular area, but it's not a factor used to categorize categorize these biomes. So there's two broad categories of aquatic biomes. There's the freshwater, which are your streams, rivers, lakes, and wetlands, and then there's your marine, where salt water is involved. So those are our sh like shallow marine areas, like estuaries and coral reefs, and then as well as the open ocean. So that's what the objective of this lecture is, is to look at those two uh, major um, biomes, the freshwater and the marine, and the characteristics of each. So starting with our freshwater biomes, these have little or no salinity, and these consist of our streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, and freshwater wetlands. Streams and rivers are flowing freshwater, and usually this water is from runoff, which we learned about in the uh, hydrologic cycle, but it could also be fed from underground springs. So you have water trapped underground. There's an area at the surface where it's allowed to um, come out, and those will also feed water to rivers and streams. So with streams that are typically narrow, they cannot carry lots of water. Um, and rivers are just a little more wider and they carry more water. So the, the thing about this is there's no distinct uh, classification. There's no time when a stream will all of a sudden become a river. So there's this kind of hard distinction between the two. But just know that rivers are much wider and can carry more water. And then as that water flow changes, you're going to see biological communities are also going to change. So most streams and many fast-flowing rivers, they have very few plants or algae to act as producers. So what happens is fallen leaves are usually the base of the food web. And what we have is this organic matter is going to be consumed by larvae or crustaceans like crayfish and then provide um, food. And they provide food for the consumers like fish. But as the uh, fast-moving streams combined to form rivers, the water flow is going to slow down. And the, the slowing down of the water allows sediments and organic material to settle to the bottom. And here we'll see plant growth, even plants rooting themselves into the ground and allowing for more abundant life. The other important thing is fast-moving streams and rivers will have turbulent water like rapids, which I'm sure you've seen before. And this these rapids allow the water to mix with the air, so what we're going to get is these high oxygen environments. And in these high oxygen environments where the water is moving very fast, we'll see fish like trout and salmon that need large amounts of oxygen to survive. Whereas in those slow moving waters, you know, you'll see catfish, all those animals that can tolerate low oxygen environments. So moving on to lakes and ponds. So now we have standing water. So the water may be flowing slowly from a lake or pond, but it's, it's um, not moving like it would in a river or stream. So, and we're going to see that lakes are larger, and pond, larger than ponds, but again, there's this no distinction. There's no point where we're like, okay, now this pond has become a lake. So essentially what you need to know is that lakes, in this case, are much larger than ponds. And there's these zones in lakes, and we're, it's important that you know each one, and we're going to start from the shallow area and work our way down. So the littoral zone. What's happening in the littoral zone is it's a shallow area. It's near the shore. A lot of photosynthesis can occur because we have these plants that are rooted, like your cattails and things like that. As we move away from the shore, um, we end up in the limnetic zone. So Water's a little deeper, the rooted plants can't, can no longer survive, so the phytoplankton uh, floating or near at the surface are the only photosynthetic organisms. And this zone will last as deep as sun can penetrate. So depending on the lake or pond, you know, how much sediment is suspended in the lake or pond um, determines the amount of sunlight penetrating the water. Um, it's going to depend on where the or how many organisms can exist. Then eventually when light cannot um, penetrate the water anymore, we have this profundal zone. And so you have low oxygen 
Um, nutrients here are not easily recycled into the food web. So what we have is mostly bacteria decomposing detritus that has fallen from the uh, top of the water. And so there's low dissolved oxygen. And as a result, it doesn't support many large organisms. So, and finally, we'll reach the bottom, which we call the benthic zone. And it's usually just this muddy area where not much life exists. So we can also uh, ca categorize lakes and ponds by their level of primary productivity. So remember, primary producer are your uh, autotrophs, your plants. So for example, looking at these three pictures, and you've seen this through your different studies in regards to trophic levels, the more abundant plant life, the more diverse the plant life, the more other species down the line that it can support. So we'll start with the least amount of life and end with the most abundant. Oligotrophic lakes, not a lot of productivity. They don't have many nutrients like nitrogen and potassium. These are your high mountain lakes, you know, uh, maybe a few trees surrounding them, clear blue water, but again, not much life because there's not many nutrients. Mesotrophic, we have this moderate level. You might get some algae in the late summer. Again, these might uh, freeze over in the winter. You have some, again, the plants allowing for some life, but again, not a lot. It's in between. So the most abundant pr productivity from a lake is we call them eutrophic lakes. So, and you can see in the picture, you have sediment allowing plants to root themselves and grow. You'll have plants all around the shoreline, which again will allow for many other different organisms and animals to uh, coexist. Moving away from plants or uh, lakes and ponds, we're going to go to even more standing water, which are freshwater wetlands. And these are usually submerged water, just saturated with water for at least part of the year. They are very shallow, so you can have vegetation. And it's important to point out that these are the some of the most productive uh, areas on Earth in regards to uh, life and sustainability. So there's three types we're going to look at. And there's a minor differences between the three. So the first one, the picture up at the top left, those are our, our marshes. I'm sorry, those are your swamps. And you can see in the picture that swamps contain emergent trees. So trees can exist. They can grow out of the water. Um, these mostly exist kind of in the southeastern United States. You're talking Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, Georgia. Whereas on you move on to the marshes, you can see in the picture on the top right, this is non-woody vegetation, things like cattails and sedges. Those will exist in that environment. And finally, we move to bogs. Bogs are very, very acidic. If you do have any trees, there's usually just those spruce trees um, and a lot of moss. So there's your types of freshwater wetlands. Something incredibly important to point out is that these provide an ecosystem service. And they're very important not only for our existence, but the health of the ecosystem as well. So for example, wetlands can take in a lot of rainwater. And what they'll do is they'll release it extremely slowly. And as a result, it replenishes groundwater that's being taken out, maybe by wells or groundwater from that's feeding a, another stream through a spring. And what this does, it reduces the severity of floods and droughts. Wetlands will also, as that water is going down through the ground, it'll filter pollutants from the water. And as it recharges that groundwater, now that groundwater is clean. Important for organisms that many bird species depend on wetlands, either migration or breeding. And as many as one-third of endangered bird species in the United States spend some part of their lives in wetlands. So what we see is as wetlands are drained or as they're um, built over, it's a direct result is you have these endangered birds that our populations are dropping as a result. And so finally, this biome makes up only 5% of the nation's land area. And more than half of the freshwater wetland in the U.S. has been drained for agriculture development or to eliminate breeding grounds for mosquitoes or other uh, disease organisms. 
Switching over to our marine biomes now. So now we're, these are biomes that contain salt water. So we're going to look at salt marshes, mangrove swamps, intertidal zones, coral reefs, and open oceans. Starting with salt marshes. We also call these estuaries. So what an estuary is, it's a, a part where fresh water starts mixing with salt water. And we see this when a river meets an ocean. So, and remember going back, rivers are carrying many nutrients. They've been uh, flowing across the land, picking up nutrients. And when they hit that ocean, they drop it all out. And so what we see happening is a huge uh, influx of uh, populations of producers for plants and algae and then you know life fish birds and things like that will succeed as a result these are very impo important because what they do is they filter contaminants and they're also very important for spawning fish it's believed that two-thirds of all marine fish and shellfish spend some time spend some time of their life cycle in a salt marsh, which is usually during their larval stage. Moving on to mangrove swamps. So we see these in the tropical, subtropical coast. You have mangroves that you can see in the picture. Those are salt tolerant. And it's very interesting if you ever see a mangrove tree and you can look at the back side of the leaf and you have these white circles. The mangrove has done an amazing job of adapting to taking water out of the the salty environment and releasing that salt through its leaves. So very interesting. And they also protect the coastlines from erosion, storm damage, and even you can see the roots of those mangrove trees. They allow, they trap organic material like falling leaves. And what they do is they produce this nutrient rich environment and they'll also provide shelter for fish and shellfish. Going to our intertidal zones now, you have this very narrow band, and it's also in this area is dependent on high and low tide. And it's a very, very difficult place to survive if you're an organism. You have waves crashing, there's periods, it could be up to 8 to 12 hours where you have low tide, where you're, you, know, you can see in the picture you have sea stars exposed, um, you have to the sunlight, to high temperatures, desiccation, another word for drying out. So sea stars, sponges, mussels, crabs, Barnacles, they have done an amazing job adapting to this really, like I, we mentioned, a very difficult environment to survive. And finally, one of the most diverse or the most diverse biome on Earth is coral reefs, which is very interesting as you can see because the water is pretty, doesn't have many nutrients. But we're going to see here in a second how it can provide just this wealth of uh, biodiversity and life. These are found in Warm, shallow waters were beyond the shoreline. That's important to note. And it's this symbio symbiotic relationship. So corals are these tiny animals, and what they do is they secrete a layer of calcium carbonate, which we call limestone, and they form this external skeleton. And this animal living inside this little skeleton, it is, it's like this hollow tube, and you can see it here zoomed in. It's just this hollow tube with tentacles and it'll grab plankton or any other things floating around and they'll live in the water. And again, like we mentioned, it's a, not a lot of nutrients, but this is possible because of the algae. So what the algae will do is they live within the tissues of the corals. So here we have coral digesting food, it captures and then it releases CO2 and other nutrients. So what the algae is doing, it's hanging out it uses that CO2 that the plant during photosynthesis to produce sugars and nutrients, stimulating the algae to release their sugars to the coral. Coral gets energy from the sugars, algae gets the CO2 and the nutrients, and a safe place to live within this tiny little limestone skeleton. But this association with photosynthetic algae means that corals can live only in shallow waters where light can penetrate. So you need shallow water, you need light for that algae. And as a result, these skeletons, we'll go back real quick to this, provide just this, again, wealth of biodiversity in the area. Unfortunately, though, coral reefs are facing a wide range of challenges from pollutants to sediments that make it difficult for them to survive. They're also facing what we call coral bleaching, in which what's happening is the algae inside the corals are dying. So remember, there's a symbiotic relationship. The, the coral is getting the... Uh, sugar from the algae, 
So if the algae is dying, hence the coral is going to die as well. So without the algae, the coral soon dies. And what happens is the reef turns white, hence that term bleaching. And what scientists believe is that the algae are dying from a combination of disease and environmental changes, including, including, including a lower ocean pH. So what's happening is the ocean is becoming more acidic. And as a result, the algae can't sustain. They die, and again, um, the coral dies as well. High water temperatures are causing this as well. So essentially, we can say that the entire coral reef biome is in danger now, all around the world due to increased temperatures of the ocean water and uh, lower pH. Lastly, we're going to look at the open ocean. So here we have deep water. We're away from the shoreline. Light cannot no longer reach the bottom. And so there's these two zones, which we call in the open ocean, your photic zone and your aphotic zone. And this is easy to remember. Think photic or a photo. You need a flash for light. The pref A before the word, the prefix aphotic means just without light. So our photic zone, we again, we have light, which again will allow for photosynthesis. You have algae uh, being the major producers. And then we all know how the food web goes from there. In the aphotic zone, we're in a deep layer. There's no light for photosynthesis, but we do still have life. And this is due to chemosynthesis. So in this picture here, you have a hydrothermal vent giving off heat. There's this bacteria that have adapted to live in these high methane, high hydrogen sulfide environments. They, in turn, are the primary producers in the aphotic zone. And we do see some life down there. And fish that have adapted to live in those extreme environments. So that wraps it up for aquatic biomes. Make sure you remember you can always go back and refer to this lecture if you have any questions or you can stop by and see me.